I'm Julian Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. I would like to ask uh, Peter Braxton, uh, could you explain a little bit more about uh, who uh, supervises the state-owned enterprises about uh, the uh, salary setting and uh, social welfare uh, distribution within the uh, state-owned enterprises. Thank you. Good. I, I think we'll, this sex, uh, session will do it one by one. So, Peter, you can a answer this question. Yes, thank you. Uh, on the supervision of, of the state-owned enterprises, it's basically divided uh, through uh, the ministries. Uh, I, th I think today there are primarily three ministries that own or has the responsibility for state ownership, uh, and they have then the, the uh, uh, responsibility of, of, of supervising them and, and having discussions. Uh, in terms of salary, uh, I think uh, the ministers uh, primarily has to look into sort of uh, board remuneration, so uh, and and then also to some extent the uh, the pay to the top management. So that's typically the CEO and maybe one or two more of of, of, of management, and then it's basically left for the board of directors and uh, uh, and management to decide on the level of wages for for the rest of the companies. Uh, and then we have an o overarching principle that's saying that the state and enterprises should pay market-based uh, wages, but they should not be leading in, in, in the wage game. So they should be quite conservative in how they, they set wages. Uh, and it's more or less the same when it comes to sort of social protection. The company should basically follow general Dan Danish rules on, on, on labor protections and stuff. Uh, so, so I think that's sort of the legal framework, but of course we have an expectation that they should be probably be best in class when it comes to uh, protecting workers, uh, social benefits, and uh, behave uh, uh, sort of as as a better of the private companies. Okay. Yeah, in the back here. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Don Ali Mari from Repower Tanzania. My question is uh, not directed to any specific speakers, but more general in terms of, uh, it seems to me from the experience of uh, Vietnam and also from Nordic countries that uh, selective uh, state ownership, uh, which is more strategic, is good for the economy. Um, but there has been uh, uh, increasing uh, concern and, of course, uh, advice from the World Bank and the other, uh, and the other organizations for blanket privatization. Um, just privatize everything, including uh, utilities, uh, uh, transportation, uh, on, the, on the ground that they, the, the state ownership is inefficient. Um, my question is, uh, what is your take on that, and what, should you, what would you have advised developing countries if you were the World Bank? Let's start with the John. <laughs> yeah. Uh, th thank you for your question. That's a tough one, um, but I think it's 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 tougher when you look at Denmark with its what is it three percent of GDP associated with the SOEs than when you look at a country that has several thousand uh, big SOEs um, and. Uh, maybe firm performance and economic efficiency are not the only uh, criteria. So, so it's complicated, and those other things need to be to be uh, uh, thought about. But I actually did not interpret either of the uh, two other speakers on this panel as suggesting that um, retaining large numbers of state enterprises is a is a good long term policy. That was not my interpretation, but maybe I'll put the ball in their courts to uh, answer that. Dr. Kuhn? For, um, for Vietnam, I think it uh, is quite easy to uh, identify uh, which uh, enterprises is strategic. And um, nobody advised us to privatize uh, wholly that uh, network industries and uh, industries 
uh, strategic industries. But um, we uh, think about how to increase the efficiency of these uh, enterprises. And for the first uh, thing we have to do, we should create uh, the market institutions uh, to f in the industries. For example, nowadays, uh, what, I, what I mean market uh, institutions is we should separate uh, the policy makers, uh, market regulators, and enterprises, and owners and enterprises. But nowadays, uh, for example, electricity in Vietnam, and many of the uh, industries and commerce, uh, they Mm, they are uh, the mark, um, policy makers and regulators and also state owners. So when I think that we should separate uh, an avian, avian here is Vietnam uh, Electricity uh, Corporation. They, uh, they dominant, uh, that is dominant buyers, that monopoly, the origin monopoly uh, in the buyers of electricity from the other produ producers. So I think that there is no market because it is only buyers. And secondly, in the uh, uh, regulatory framework here is that uh, policymakers and uh, stakeholders and uh, regulators is the same. So here I think it is not appropriate uh, um, institutions for the market to work. So we firstly think to uh, the, the set up uh, market institutions and then open the industry to uh, more investors. So uh, that's, that is our strategy. Peter, do you want to add? If I'm going to just add a few things. Uh, I think what I said was kind of the official line. And uh, I, I think there was one question I didn't really uh, try to answer, and that is, when are the reasons for the state to own something sufficient? I just said they had to be very strong. Uh, and I think if you ask me personally, I think uh, in Denmark we could easily privatize uh, at least half of the 20 odd uh, state owned enterprises that we have. Uh, uh, I don't think the majority of the politicians in Denmark would agree with me on, on, on that one. So I don't think it's going to, to happen. Uh, and therefore, of course, you can always find some reasons uh, why you shouldn't privatize, but uh, if you really analyze the reasons, it's not really, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, so that was one thing, and, and I think it's, of course, there will always be trade-off, because uh, if the state-owned enterprises are extremely inefficient or very inefficient, then privatization uh, might be one of the means that you can actually do something about it. So, so of course, if the cost of having state-owned enterprises is big enough, then you ought to go down the privatization route, even though you might find less stronger argument for, for not privatizing things. Just one small follow-up point. The excuse that an industry is strategic, I don't want to discount entirely, but it can also be misused. Let me give you one example. In Moldova, um, wine production was a strategic industry that uh, was intended to be retained as a state monopoly because it was so important <laughs> to exports principally to Russia and Ukraine. Um, so the, the state ownership of the wine industry meant that, there, that they for, forewent um, uh, all of the kind of restructuring and new uh, 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 entry of vineyards and winemakers, foreign and domestic technological change, et cetera, which has really improved the quality of wine in Eastern Europe, of which I can assure you has happened. We have two speakers in front here. Oh. Hi, I'm Emilio Larovri from Frederick University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I would like to uh, ask uh, Peter if you could please further elaborate on what you name as the state acting as no most shareholder. Because actually, if you take, for instance, uh, say, energy sector or your companies or utilities. Of course, they are very key uh, tools for governments to implement some economic policy. 
So uh, I would be curious if you could uh, uh, tell us a little bit about the experience in other countries. We know they've been experimenting with carbon taxes and of course removal of fossil fuel subsidies has been uh, longly due and recommended by the IMF and uh, a lot of reports. So uh, how can you reconcile this kind of new governance model that uh, you propose with this strategic role of these companies uh, for uh, meeting these governmental targets? Peter, yeah. Yeah, when, I, when I'm speaking as uh, the state acting as a normal shareholder, it's, it's very much the ownership role. Uh, and as Mr. Chung has said, uh, what we have, are trying to achieve all the time is to make a clear division that, of course, the state have other interest uh, in terms of being <clears throat> a, a, a public authority, so uh, so so take energy policy for example. It's for the Ministry of uh, Climate and Energy. They must set their rules so they meet the objectives in energy and climate policy. But we in the Ministry of Finance, in our role as owner of the largest energy company in Denmark, should only act as though we are an, a, a normal shareholder and only concerned about uh, getting a return on on our investment. So. So that's why we, what we try to achieve, and I think we have done in, in most cases. So it's in that context we should see uh, the state act as a normal shareholder. So. Thank you. My name is Le Dang Zuan from uh, Vietnam. I have a question for three speakers. In the state-owned enterprises, they are all in all countries a problem of vested interest and interest group, non-transparent financial relation. I wonder how do you evaluate what for progress has been made by reforming the SOE and whether after the reforming, after privatization, the vested interest has been really eliminated and no more interest group hidden interest group has been, uh, could exist and um, there are no more non-transparent financial relation between state officials and the uh, CEO of the equitized or uh, privatized state-owned enterprises. Thank you. I think we will start with Dr. Kung this time because uh, I would like to hear that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, my observation is that um, even after the equitization or privatization, there's still vested interest because uh, even when we equitize uh, maybe my uh, larger shares of state enterprises, there's the connection between government officials and uh, in the managers. They uh, previously, uh, the uh, also, they previously also uh, the government officials. They are friends. Therefore, and second observation is that uh, the, um, the mother company and subsidiaries, when subsidiaries uh, privatize, even privatize 100% of state ownership, there's still very strong connection and even some opportunities, uh, business opportunities, uh, the private um, mother company, they do not share with the, their subsidiaries, but they share totally to the, the friends of uh, the companies. I think that uh, what, is, uh, what, what is my observation, and therefore I don't think that only privatization will uh, abolish uh, the vested interest. It's also, can I just turn the word to you, John? Uh, because uh, in Russia, uh, we hear a lot of stories about this as well, with vested interests in uh, state-owned companies. So do you have? Um, I'm <clears throat> I guess I'm next. Um, <laughs> of, of course, uh, uh, privatization is not a panacea. Um, so uh, p to some extent, people's interests are going to remain the same, but it's also possible that their interests change 
somewhat. So uh, the managers of the company may take a greater interest in in uh, uh, in the firm's performance subsequently. And I think the. I don't want to say the fact, but the, but the very strong evidence that firm performance does tend to systematically improve following privatization suggests that behavior has also changed. So those, those vested interests may still be there. Of course, in every country around the world, uh, 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 there, are, there are problems of, of special interests and um, Right. So, 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 and corruption. Um, <clears throat> so, 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 these are not going to go away because of privatization. But the fact that firm behavior is changing is some evidence that it's also having an effect on on those um, vested interests, which are otherwise very hard to observe. The nice thing about firm performance is we can estimate it, and measure it. Just a few additional comments. I think uh, looking at the state-owned enterprise that we have, I think the most important thing in, um, in dealing with uh, vested interest is actually dividing the roles of the states. So you have an ownership function and you have an authority function uh, because it, it naturally gives a, a competition between the different lines in, in the civil service that the I can see it clearly with one with our energy company in the old days, 15 years ago, they always came and saw all of us at the same time and said we have to solve their problems. Uh, but now they can't do that and the Minister of Climate and Energy is very firm that they wouldn't be seen as uh, granting favors to the Danish energy company, in, in particular not because it's owned by the Minister of Finance. So it actually creates a, a, a good uh, sort of uh, uh, structure uh, uh, for dealing with this, uh, and I'm also sure the same goes. We should take the state further and privatize the company. It would naturally uh, any vested interest would tend to go away gradually, or at least be to a no more normal level of what you will see from other private companies that always that that also pursues uh, vested interests uh, to some extent. So. The guy. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Witness Smege from uh, African Economic Research Consortium in Kenya. So I, I have, uh, I think, uh, two questions to the first presenter. Uh, so, so the first, I think, is um, well, I, I don't think you, I, I got the explanation of why uh, the effect of foreign ownership uh, on productivity is, is is so huge. And then the other thing that I also wanted to get a sense of is. Um, uh, why there's a big difference between 100% on, uh, private ownership and uh, having an, a, 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 what I would call a passive or a minority state ownership because um, I don't know to what extent that small uh, ownership would influence the performance of the company or, or should influence the performance of the company or decision making. Then the last thing that I want to check with you is um, uh, whether you looked at uh, sectoral differences in the in the productivity effects of privatization, because it could be that uh, certain sectors, maybe there could be larger gains than in other sectors. And, and if you compare across the five countries, maybe the, 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 sect the sectors are different. So, so, so it might actually sort of bias the, the, the outcomes. Thank you. I actually counted three questions. Um, uh, the fr so, so I'd like to, to, to be careful to distinguish what the econometric analysis of the data tell us from speculation. And actually, uh, you're primarily asking me to speculate, but there's been lots and lots of discussion about particularly the first issue, foreign versus domestic. And so the speculations involve um, the possibility that foreign investors are bringing access to new technologies, to uh, international markets, new ways of, uh, of management, and, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, and international quality standards and things like this that um, they're already familiar with. 
So, but those are speculations because in these data sets, we don't actually observe what the, uh, uh, what the managers are, are, are doing. What we do observe is a very clear uh, difference in the applied, the implied uh, uh, effect of privatization on productivity and uh, some other performance measures. Why is 100% better than, ma than majority? This was actually that it's so much better, uh, uh, twice as much across all our specifications and outcome variables was actually a, a, a bit of a surprise. This is actually a very recent result. We'd already, always been looking at majority and to some extent majority versus minority before. Um, and uh, a speculation here would be that the, the private owners, even if in control, may worry that the 10% Danish owner that wants to limit them from moving their, uh, uh, so, so the Danish state owner wants to prevent them from, from moving their headquarters or doing something else. This is still some leverage over the uh, over the company, and uh, that it is so important is is a uh, uh, is surprising. But the data s are speaking very clearly on that. Um, <clears throat> finally, on the sectoral difference differences, there are sectoral differences. Um, maybe just a, a big one that I would mention is that it turns out that we estimate uh, larger effects uh, on the manufacturing than in non-manufacturing. Um, uh, and uh, a speculation as to why that is, is that it's the manufacturing sector that maybe can benefit more from technological change, from access to finance, that's another issue actually for, for foreign investors, and, um, <clears throat> and uh, those other advantages that the private, uh, including both domestic and foreign investors, might be able to bring. Um, and we, we, we have done a kind of a decomposition analysis looking at the, at the uh, um, different industrial uh, composition of these economies and uh, say, well, what if we applied the average industrial composition of all of them and re-estimate, so re-weighting our results, it doesn't affect the results materially. So they're essentially the same. But it's a, it's a really interesting question. What's the source of those cross-industry differences is an area of active research, may I say. Okay, uh, final. Uh, Justin. Um, my question can be either to John or Dr. Kwong. We are talking about the ownership, state owned enterprises. But are we looking at the right questions? Because we know a lot of the state owned enterprises now exist in Russia or in Vietnam. In general, are too capital intensive compared to their stage of development. And under that kind of situation, they are not viable and they need to receive subsidies from the government in order to survive. And under this kind of situation, even you privatize them 100%, they are still receiving government subsidies protection in order to survive. And uh, if we compare the incentive structure or rent seeking, whether it have a high incentive to rent seeking in the form of a state ownership over the private ownership. I think that might be a more relevant question just to talk about the uh, 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 you know, ownership reform and so on, or property, re uh, property right reform. So that's my comments, and I'd like to have your reaction to that comments. Dr. Kuhn? I think that uh, for the first thing we, uh, we think about is the separation that state as owners and state as uh, policy makers. Maybe policy makers want us to subsidize. But uh, uh, that is clear. If that is subsidies uh, the for the, the, the social the benefit or the country benefit, it is clear what is the price you have to pay and where the society accepts that price. I think that uh, it is the ownership I, I, what I, I talk about is that it's clear objective and the um, transparent, especially uh, financial aspect between the state budget and state uh, uh, shareholders. So whether we should pay uh, uh, the price 
to, to give uh, some subsidies and many other uh, objectives that is what I concerned. So if I understand your question, Justin, um, it's isn't the soft budget constraint the bigger problem? And possibly, but one of the uh, possible advantages of privatization is, in fact, that it may reduce that, uh, 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 that softness. Um, certainly, certainly, the continued role of the state is a, is a, is a very important issue in these countries and uh, in some more than others. Um, Transparency is always going to be hard to achieve, whether the state is a shareholder or not, because there's so many different ways that uh, support and subsidies can be uh, um, uh, can be provided. So I guess I'm not sure. I think there are a lot of questions here. Um, they're interrelated, um, uh, since since arguably privatization may be a tool. You may regard it, regard it as a tool for reducing the softness of budget constraints but it's just one of many. And uh, improving the functioning of the state sector is certainly another one. OK. We have uh, went, over th we went over time. But I think we should uh, thank the three presenters for excellent presentations. And thank you to all of you.